Oops. Okay, so we talked about this slide yesterday. We zoomed in from the macroscopic all the way down to beyond the microscopic, something that you would only be able to see with the most powerful microscopes, which is inside of the chloroplast. So we started off with the leaf, something that you can see with your naked eye. Obviously, we are all familiar with leaves, but most of us don't know that leaves actually have very, very tiny pores, just like our skin has pores. Pores, of course, let things in and they let certain things out. For leaves, those microscopic pores are called stomata and they allow carbon dioxide into the cell and they allow oxygen out of the cell. Why does, this, why does the plant need carbon dioxide? Lexi, this is related to that question that you asked yesterday. To do photosynthesis? Yes, and can you be more specific? Remember there was a, there was a phrase yesterday that you asked a question about. The, are you talking about the cycle? Uh, no, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Here it is. I gotta stop doing that, making my slides so low. But what I'm talking about is this process of carbon fixation. Remember you asked about that? Yes. So we need carbon dioxide because, or plants, I'm sorry, plants need carbon dioxide because they need to be able to fix that carbon. They need to take that carbon and then make it into something else. And the other, what's, and the thing that they're making it into is glucose, but they need that source of carbon. They take carbon from the air and they fixate it into something that's solid. They take a gas, carbon dioxide, and they fixate it into something that's solid, glucose. And of course, oxygen is a waste product. So the plants allow oxygen to flow out of their stomata. Why is that so important? I don't know, man. Oh man, my microphone is so Think about it. Why you, you do know what is what's so important about oxygen coming out of plants? We can breathe. Right, exactly. We need, we all, everybody else on, on earth needs uh, oxygen. We need it to do respiration. So, and not just humans, but all animals um, and many other types of, of life. So it's super important that this process of photosynthesis produces oxygen and that oxygen is released by the plants. Of course, then we zoom in. Okay. Question? Rain this whole thing down. Um, yeah, I thought we had, okay, so ho I was hoping that you had written it down yesterday, but that's fine. We can take time to do it right now. But yes, it would be a good idea. Okay. So as you write, I'll just continue to talk, but I'll talk slowly and more quietly. Um, so inside of the leaves, there is a mesophyll. That's what the middle layer of the leaves is called, the mesophyll. And the mesophyll is packed with a lot of things, just like humans have multiple types of organs, which have multiple types of tissues, which are made up of multiple types of cells. Plants also have different types of cells as well. But some of these specific plant cells have chloroplast inside of them. And these are the cells that are responsible for photosynthesis. So we're zooming in further. Now we have zoomed into the mesophyll, we're zooming in further into a specific type of plant cell, and we're zooming in even further to look at a chloroplast inside of a plant cell. And as you can imagine, as we zoom in, we're also increasing the amount of things there are. So within one leaf, there are a lot of stomata. There are a lot of those pores. And inside a single, single stomata, there would be a lot of plant cells. Inside a single plant cell, there would be a there would be several chloroplasts. And inside of the chloroplast, 
their, that internal environment is called a stroma. And inside of a single chloroplast, there are a lot of what we call thylakoids. These thylakoids are actually the site of photosynthesis. They have a lot of chlorophyll, which allow them to absorb sunlight and use it for photosynthesis. So what we're looking at is, for lack of a better term, I won't get too sophisticated here, we're looking at, if we think of a thylakoid as a cell, we've got a cell inside of a cell inside of a cell. Thylakoids inside of chloroplast, inside of plant cells. And you also hear us in this lesson refer to something called the lumen. And the lumen is the inside of a thylakoid, just like the cytoplasm is the inside of a cell. I'm almost back. I'll go. Okay. Selena, are you still here with us? Yeah, I wrote it yesterday. Okay. Lexi, let me know when you're done. And Selena, while we wait for Lexi, the cell is surrounded by a membrane. The chloroplast is also surrounded by a membrane and the thylakoids are also surrounded by a membrane. What do you, what do you think all of those membranes are made of? What makes up those membranes? Mm. Let me really think about this. <laughs> like, what you mean, like the the um gooey stuff? Um, I don't know what you mean by gooey stuff, but oh, you know, you know the um, what is it called? The cytoplasm? No. So we've got we've got those four biological compounds. Right. Oh, lipids. One of them, lipids, exactly. Yes, lipids are what make up the membrane. Okay. okay. So the fact that chloroplasts are surrounded by their own membrane makes them what we call a membrane bound organelle. And so the theory, and one that we'll talk much more about later in the course, is that chloroplasts used to be their own freestanding organism. They were at one point a prokaryote. Now they evolved and they lost some of their, you know, genetic abilities. Um, they lost some of their, some of their autonomous abilities. But um, once they were incorporated by another cell, meaning they got basically sucked into another cell, they started to become an organelle instead of their own free living type of cell, all right? So these membranes are really what kind of stand at the foundation of this theory that chloroplasts used to be their own thing. But today we're gonna to talk about what are called light dependent reactions. Now, I'm not gonna tell you all what you should take notes on, but uh, I think it'll be pretty implied as we go. And I'm gonna to try to take my time as I explain these things. Um, so that you all have ample time to, to write things down. But these light dependent reactions obviously depend on light. And there are really two of these reactions that are taking place as we'll discuss. <clears throat> but 
photosynthesis can be broken down into light dependent reactions and light independent reactions. Today we'll talk about the light dependent reactions. Monday we'll come back and talk about the light independent reaction. These light dependent reactions use light energy from the sun to make two molecules that will be needed for the next stage of photosynthesis, which is the light independent reaction. So that simple, re that simple chemical reaction uh, that we knew from 10th grade biology is much more complicated, right? Even though we looked at it, I'm gonna come back to that slide, but even though we were looking here at this basic reaction, six carbon dioxide molecules react with six water molecules, they use energy from the sun to do photosynthesis. They produce glucose and six oxygen molecules. It's much more complicated than that. We've got a lot of intermediate steps that allow us to get all the way to glucose. And we're going to talk about those intermediate steps now. But one of these light dependent reactions produces the energy storage molecule, ATP. Obviously, you all are familiar with ATP. And another reaction produces something called NADPH. That does obviously stand for something. It's not important what it stands for. But essentially, this NADPH is needed to carry electrons. It carries two electrons. So that's the end goal of, this, of, this, of these light-dependent reactions, to make two things, ATP and NADPH. You will see this information come up again, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. As I have verbally mentioned, but now I'm showing it to you so that you will write it down, these light-dependent reactions take place in the membranes of thylakoids. So thylakoids look like small disks that are kind of they're stacked on top of one another. They, they have their own membrane that's also, just like Selena said, made up of phospholipids. And embedded in these membranes are two protein complexes called photosystems. Two really big proteins. And these proteins, which we call photosystems, are needed to absorb light. And as they absorb the light, that light delivers energy to the photosystems. And we're going to see this take place in the images that, I'm, that I have for you all. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm <clears throat> so one of the questions that you'll see in the POJL asks, what is another name for the light dependent reactions? You might sometimes see it referred to as linear photophosphorylation. And this was a term that did come up in the Khan Academy article that I asked you guys to read a couple of nights ago. That's a long word, but essentially it means that it uses light, that's what photo, to phosphorylate something, which means that we'll see this happen later. We take an ADP, adenosine diphosphate, we add a 
another phosphate to it. That's a process called phosphorylation. So we make adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So <clears throat> linear phos photophosphorylation means taking light, using it to make ATP. And it's called linear because typically the electrons don't start over in the process. It's possible that they can, and they mentioned that in the Khan Academy article, um, and that would happen under specific conditions. But typically, once the electrons have made their way through this process, they don't go back. So it's called linear instead of cyclical. So this was the same image that you all saw in the video that I assigned to you on Khan Academy, as well as the article about light and I'm sorry, light dependent reactions on Khan Academy. But we're going to kind of break it down because sometimes they can move pretty quickly and the articles can be dense. <clears throat> so first thing to point out is that this is taking place in a chloroplast. And in that chloroplast, there are several thylakoids, which you can see here that look like discs. They're stacked on top of each other. We've got an outside environment that's called the stroma. So when I say outside, we're still inside of the chloroplast, but we're outside of the thylakoid. So the outside, the external environment is called the stroma. The internal environment, the interior, is called the lumen. So the first thing we had to establish is that there's an outside and there's an inside. What? Okay. So here in this first image, you can see that there are these two photosystems. They are called photosystem two and photosystem one. We can shorten that to PS2 and PS1. These are large complexes that are made up of proteins and pigment. Pigment is a chemical that can absorb light and reflect light. So there are many types of pigment that would be found in this photo in these photosystems, but there are two specific special types that we'll talk about. And those are P680 and P700. But ultimately the role of these photosystems is to harvest light energy from the sun. So not only to absorb it, but to put it to use. So light's coming in from the outside is being absorbed by these photosystems and the photosystems are going to use that light. So we, we've got to focus on, in this process, the movement of an electron. And in fact, we're going to determine and, and that this process could be called the electron transport chain. Because the movement of the electron is really what's powering this process in which we make ATP and in, in which we make NADPH. So we obviously we need to start at the source of the electron. The electron comes from the splitting of a water molecule. So obviously water is a reactant 
in photosynthesis. Plants need water. Water is going to be split apart, as we can see in this reaction down here. H2O is split, it becomes an oxygen atom and two hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are basically protons and electrons really, really, well, oxygen really, really likes electrons. So we can almost think of oxygen as an electron, it's pulling electrons towards it. So many of the electrons that are attracted to oxygen are also strongly attracted to P680, this pigment. And so P680 is going to pull off an electron from oxygen. And that's where this process starts. Water is split, creating an oxygen atom and two hydrogen ions. An electron gets pulled away from that oxygen atom and it enters this photosystem, PS2. So you guys read the article. Does anybody remember why we call, why this first photosystem is actually called PS2? Okay. We call this first photosystem PS2 because we discovered the other one first. So this was the second one we discovered. So even though it comes first in the process, we call it PS2 because it was discovered after PS1. Fun fact, you don't really need to know that, but. So an electron has been stolen away from oxygen and it's been stolen by this P680, this pigment, and it enters this photosystem, photosystem two. Any questions about anything so far? Okay. Not really, no. So the other important thing to note out here, Lexi, you, when I asked earlier, why is it important that oxygen is produced? Uh, you initially didn't know, but obviously you did end up figuring it out. But this is where we get the oxygen from. So once water is split, we're left with an oxygen atom. If that process happens twice, well, when it happens twice, one oxygen atom ends up getting bonded to another one, we end up creating O2. And O2 is the gas that our bodies need for respiration. Okay, so what we're seeing is that nature is really good at pairing up reactions so that energy is not wasted. When energy is produced by one reaction, that energy is then used by another reaction that needs energy to take place. We also see that it's not wasting any matter either. So the oxygen that is produced in the splitting of a water molecule is then used to make oxygen gas. So nothing is wasted. And this is what you might hear people refer to as intelligent design, right? Because they're, they're implying that this could not have just naturally happened, that something had to have, uh, there had to have been some intentional design behind this. Depends on your belief system, I guess. Okay. So let's look more closely at a photo system. So we've got the stroma. Again, the stroma is the internal environment of a chloroplast, but it's actually outside of a thylakoid. So the inside of the thylakoid is called the lumen. The thylakoid membrane separates the two. So 
So the membrane separates the inside of the thylakoid from the outside, which we will call the stroma. And we can see this membrane. It looks just like uh, the other cell membranes that we've talked about in the past. They're made up of the same thing, these phospholipids. What do we know about phospholipids? What's special about the heads? Do you all remember anything? What is the special quality that the heads have? Are they uh, non are they hydrophobic? hydrophobic? They are hydrophilic, which means that they are polar. And so what do you know about the tails then? That they're hydrophobic. They're hydro and not right. And what does it mean to be hydrophobic? You're afraid of water. Yes, they don't like water. So perfect. We've got the exact same type of membrane that you would find in a plant cell or an animal cell. Um, we've got that same membrane that thylakoids use. Okay, so and it's important to note the chemical properties that make those membranes useful for an animal cell are the same chemical properties that make them useful for a plant cell, which are the same chemical properties that make them useful for anything that's trying to separate its internal environment from its external environment. All right, but <clears throat> as we look at these photosystems, we also want to be aware of the steps that are taken and what's really happening in these photosystems. So it's gonna start off with light energy being absorbed by a pigment in the photosystem. And a pigment is really, we can just think of it as a chemical molecule that's good at absorbing and reflecting light depending on wavelength. So light is absorbed by this pigment this pigment, which is on the outermost part of the photosystem, is then going to pass the energy inward. So it starts off, obviously, the light gets absorbed by the outermost pigments. Those outermost pigments are going to pass the energy inward. And as the energy gets passed, some of it, some of it gets lost. So anytime I'm transferring energy, some of that energy is going to be lost to my surrounding environment, typically in the form of heat. And then as the energy gets passed inward further and further, further into the photosystem, it will eventually reach what's called the special pair. <coughs> The special pair has a unique, has a, a very important job, and its job is to excite an electron. When we use the word excite in chemistry or in physics or in biology, in this case, what we're talking about is energizing something, taking it from a, a low energy state to a high energy state. Um, do you mind going back to the last slide so I can take a picture of the, um, the graph? Okay, I'm finished. Okay. Oh, this electron. And where did the electron come from? Someone remind me. Where did this electron come from? Because it didn't start off here in the photosystem. Um, the splitting of water molecules. Excellent. So that electron is the result of a water molecule being split, split apart. Good. <clears throat> And now it's going to be excited. It's going to be charged up. We're giving it energy. It started off at a low energy state, but we use energy from the light to charge it up to a higher energy state.
Now, we do have those two photo systems. Photo system two comes first, counterintuitive. Photo system one comes later. The electron transport chain is responsible for moving the electron from photo system two to photo system one. These photo systems are not connected, they're separated. They're in different places in the membrane. So in order to transport an electron from photosystem two to photosystem one, the thylakoid rely on enzymes, just like taxi cabs. The enzymes kind of serve as taxi cabs to take this electron from the first photosystem, photosystem two, to photosystem one. But again, transporting energy, even if it's in the form of an electron, is going to end up losing some of that energy to the surrounding environment. So as the electron is moving from over here in photosystem two to over here in photosystem one, it's actually returning to that lower energy state. It's losing energy to the environment. But again, life is so special, it's so intelligent that we're not actually wasting that energy. It's not just going out and just being lost to um, the environment as heat. So that's why I put lost in quotes here because the lost energy is actually going to be used. It's gonna be put to use. It has a purpose. And that purpose is that we're going to pump hydrogen into the cell. So hydrogen from the outside, I'm not, in, not into the cell, but into the thylakoid. Hydrogen from the outside environment, the stroma, is going to be pumped into the lumen. So from outside, inside, we're pumping it in, pumping it in, pumping it in, pumping it in. So that energy, even though we're losing, the electron is losing energy as it moves from photosystem two to photosystem one, that energy is being put to use. And it's being used to pump hydrogen into the thylakoid. We're bringing more and more hydrogen in. Keep in mind, there was already some hydrogen there because when we split that water molecule, we were left with two hydrogen ions, but we want more than that. So we're gonna keep, pumping more and more hydrogen into the cell. <clears throat> we, what we're left with as a result is a concentration gradient. Can someone explain to me? I know it kind of says so on the slide, but what do we mean by a concentration gradient? What does that mean? Is that like one element on the one side. Okay, it's the same more. You're on the right track. No, no more to say. Yeah, I feel. I don't know. Okay, so what you, what you're saying is that you you said there's one element on one side. What you're saying is that there's a difference in how much of something there is in one space versus another. Yes. So in this case, well, if we, if we just kind of talked about this in general terms, let's say that I had, um, let's say that I had a cup of water, two empty cups of water. I filled one cup up with water I said two empty cups of water, but two empty cups. I fill one of the cups up with water and then I dip a paper towel in one and I, dra I drape it over into the next cup. What I'm saying now is I've got more water in one cup than I do in the other. So what's gonna happen? The water is going to literally move through the paper towel 
into the other cup until the levels are equal. So what we started off with was a concentration gradient. There was more water in one area than there was in another. Typically in nature, we don't like for that to happen. We want there to be equal amounts. We want there to be an equal concentration. We can also think about this as if I had a beaker. Let's say I had a beaker. And in that beaker, I used a fence. And, but it was a really, really small fence. The holes were really, really small. And so water could get through, but other things like sugar couldn't get through. Let's say I put um, really, really sugary, sweet Kool-Aid on one side of the fence. And then on the other side of the fence, I put pure water. In order to account for that difference, we want the concentration of the sugar to be equal on both sides. So what's going to happen is that water from the pure side is going to move through the fence and go into the sugary side. This is, again, because of a concentration gradient. Concentration gradient, just as Lexi said, means that there's a different amount of something. It could be an element. It could be a larger compound. It could be energy. Concentration gradient just means that there's a different amount of something in one space than there is in the other space. So when we start, when the, when the thylakoid starts pumping hydrogen from the outside space to the inside space, we're creating a concentration gradient. We're gonna end up with way more hydrogen inside the thylakoid than there is on the outside. That does not feel good to, the, to things in nature. They wanna be at balance. So what do you all think will happen to this hydrogen when it, when it reaches this concentration gradient so that there's a lot more in the hydrogen, sorry, there's a lot more hydrogen inside of the thylakoid than there is on the outside. What's gonna happen to the hydrogen? It's gonna move to the outside. It's gonna move to the outside, excellent, yeah. So this, the thylakoid is smart though. It's doing this for a reason. And the reason is something we're gonna see in the next slide. Can I move on? Yes. Okay. So here's the reason. We just determined that there's a lot, there's now going to be a lot of hydrogen inside the thylakoid because it pumped all of that hydrogen in. It used the energy from the electron to pump hydrogen in. So now there's a lot of it on the inside. But just like Lexi just said, the hydrogen doesn't like that. It doesn't like to be packed up next to a whole bunch of hydrogen when there's a lot of space on the outside of the thylakoid where there's not a lot of hydrogen. They want to be evenly spaced. So what's going to happen is that hydrogen is going to move by diffusion out of the cell, exactly what Lexi just said. That hydrogen that we already pumped into the cell is now going to move back out. It moves from the high concentration to the low concentration. This doesn't require any energy. Okay, so the cell's not wasting any energy by doing this. This is what naturally happens because substances don't like to be crowded. So they're going to move from the crowded space, a space of high concentration, to a more open space, a space of lower concentration. So that doesn't require energy. Once that happens though, oops, I'm sorry. The hydrogen are moving through a pump in the membrane. So this, this thing that kind of looks like a keyhole here is actually a pump. And as the hydrogen move through this pump, the pump is actually turning. So again, super, super intelligent design here. We're doing something that doesn't actually require any energy and we're using it to move a pump. We're essentially, we're stealing energy from it. As that pump moves, it combines adenosine diphosphate, ADP. It combines ADP with another free phosphate group. 
So obviously, if I have ADP, which means two phosphates, and then I add a, another phosphate to it, now how many phosphates do I have? Three. So now it's instead of being diphosphate, it's triphosphate. And this is what we know as ATP. So this is how the ATP is created. This pump that we're talking about is referred to, it's called ATP synthase. When you see that ASE ending, what does that mean? Um, does that mean like sugar? I forgot. An OSE ending means sugar, but what about an ASE ending? That's an enzyme? It's an enzyme, exactly. So this pump is an enzyme that its sole responsibility is to synthesize ATP. That's why we call it ATP synthase. It's making, it's synthesizing ATP. So this process of mo the movement of hydrogen is pumping this ATP synthase. And the ATP synthase is taking ADP and, and phosphate, combining them, making ATP. ADP, phosphate, ADP, phosphate. So it's making ATP. Okay, so we're not going to get as far as I had hoped. But that process is called ATP synthesis. It's making ATP. We can see that in this original diagram right here. And we see that large ATP synthase enzyme. It's taking hydrogen from inside. That hydrogen is going to move by diffusion through this pump to the outside. And in the process, this pump gets turned and it's combining ADP with phosphate to make ATP. So now the electron is no longer located in photosystem two. It's been transported to photosystem one. We can see that in the process of being transported, it took hydrogen and it pumped it into the thylakoid. Okay, so we're over here now but the electron has lost almost all of its energy. So it's back down to a low energy state. But we're almost at the end of the electron transport chain. Okay, we're at 915. So we didn't get quite as far as I had hoped, but that's okay, this is kind of complicated stuff. And I started late, so that's on, that's on me. Um, I think that you all, I know, Selena, you expressed some issues doing the, the podial. Um, I'm going to push the due date back, but I want you to answer as many questions as possible. Some of the questions should be pretty easy because they're just asking you to look at the, you know, the first question is, what is the name of the organelle? And it very clearly says chloroplast, right? So if mo many of the questions are pretty easy like that, where you just need to look at the, the model and you can take out the information. Um, but we will... I'm going to push the due date back to probably Wednesday morning to give you guys some more time. And that gives us some more time to discuss these concepts and to go over some of the podial questions together. Um, but I do want you to make progress. Of course, keep in mind that I do have access to your podial. So I want to see that you've at least worked on worked on some of it this weekend. Yeah, I answered that question. This says something that I need to help with answer. OK. Yeah, well, we'll have some time to do that. I apologize that we didn't get to it today. But keep working. I think I think you can do some of it on your own, and then we'll talk more about it. Okay. Okay, well, thank you all for participating today, and I hope you have a good weekend. You as well.